welcome to another live stream. Today, we're going to be reacting to a video. And in this video, we're, it is about um, the impact of having a guru, the importance of having a guru. And, you know, it be it's an interesting one. Uh, I've been following Jason Gregory's um channel for quite some time so it's kind of interesting to uh come up well to see his content now and uh yeah so we'll be getting started with that in a minute um but before then um Because I think it's really important that when we listen to a teacher or when we approach a teacher, that we we are ready for the teaching. We are ready for the message that is going to be presented. So it's really important that we listen to teachers um, and we listen to what they have to say. We listen with our discernment. We listen with the understanding that not everybody will be on the same well the the guru has to talk on a very broad level and sometimes we have to kind of lift ourselves up to understand what is being said and what is being addressed so um just a bit of a warning that it may be that um, my internet goes out because of um, there's a thunderstorm right now here. So it may be that my internet may stop. Um, so I do apologize in advance if that does happen. Um, but anyway, let us let me get the video up that we'd be reacting to today. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. And we're going to. Right. So, um, okay. Right, let's get started. Yeah, I think it's best if we do that. Yeah. Okay. So, here we go. Um, one second before I, I want to share. I want to make sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay, go and make sure that um, you can hear the voice. So I was just making sure. So here we go. Let's start. So that's a young picture of Ramana Maharishi. So that's interesting. Um, okay, here we go. Guru Purnima is an auspicious day where we pay our humble respects to all of the gurus who have came before us and the ones living today. Now, sadly, the idea of the guru has become neglected in the modern day because people think it's an old idea. But we still have living gurus today and we've had all of those gurus who have come before us. And I know that on a day like today on Guru Purnima, we should pay our respects to all of those great gurus. But every day we should pay our respects to all of the great gurus that have come before us, particularly if we come from the Eastern spiritual traditions. It's very 
I agree with him. It's very important to thank your teachers for where you are today, uh, how far you've come on your journey. Without the teacher, we wouldn't be able to move forward. So I do agree with him on that level. Um, and happy Guru Purnima to all of you and um, and to the gurus that you worship. Um, so, yeah. But I, I like what he has said so far. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think I agree with Jason a lot because I've seen, I am subscribed to his channel. So uh, I am looking forward to what he has to say on this matter. Thanks to all of the great gurus that have come before us, particularly if we come from the Eastern spiritual traditions. It's very important to pay our respects because they are the ones who kept the knowledge alive so that we could benefit from it today. Now, the idea of guru has become trivialized in English, obviously, where we see we have a business guru, we have a management guru, but that is not really what the word guru is. And this has been a problem with a lot of Sanskrit words going over into English, such as karma. So we have this word guru that's been kind of trivialized. Uh, again, I agree. The word guru has been trivialized. To be honest, just because you know a bit of finance, I don't know if you should be termed as a guru because a guru is a teacher, uh, more or less on the spiritual realm um, or the spiritual aspects. Um, but the thing is, it does mean teacher. So, you know, someone does teach about finance. Should they be considered as a finance guru? or a management guru. So it's kind of hard to say yes and no to it. But to be fair, um, I think it's just a natural uh, kind of evolution of two cultures meeting together. Right. But the word guru actually means the dispeller of illusion or the one who breaks the spell of the material bondage we have in the world. So the guru helps us overcome this bondage we have in the external world and this idea of duality. That's very true. The guru takes us away from duality into non-duality. The guru tells us about what our real nature is, what our true nature is, tells us the changeless aspect of who we are and tells us not to be attracted or attached to the changing phenomena that we perceive through our senses. The Guru is very clear on these things. Um, you know, there's no question about that, uh, the level of clarity a Guru gives. Um, but this is the real definition of a Guru, not, you know, someone who can teach you finance or management, um, you know, but it can be that from gaining this spiritual wisdom, you may become a better uh, manager or a leader or even a financer, or an accountant, or a lawyer, this may help you in the long run. Um, that is only subject to people who know about the position they're in and whether they follow a, a guru or not. So, um, yeah, I kind of agree with Jason. I really like his setup. It's really nice. And I like that he has Tattva Masi at the back, like you are that. That's a very good, um, you know, I think his, I think the emphasis will always go back to, you are that. So, guru means that a speller of that ignorance. Now, sadly, in the West, the idea of guru it feels uncomfortable for a lot of people, particularly in the West. But I would say also outside of Asia, people have a sort of negative idea of guru, or they just think it. Well, I would say even in India, there is a negative connotation with the word guru as well. Um, because in India, you know, I think the the understanding that there'd be many fakes is kind of common. So, um, so I, I don't think it's just outside of India or outside of Asia, or I think it's even within India, in, even in the traditions, we may find that there are people so-called gurus who are actually fooling people who are just doing things for fame and money and power and influence so therefore it's it's a global issue i think not necessarily just a western issue or something outside of asia issue 
Also outside of Asia, people have a sort of negative idea of guru, or they just think it's an older idea. But as I said, particularly in the West, a lot of people have a negative reaction when they hear the word guru and they have a sense of skepticism. Now, this is a little bit to do more so with Western culture because Western culture is individualistic. And because Western culture is individualistic, sometimes there can be a bit of a know-it-all mentality can develop in the West. Uh, I somewhat agree. Um, there, there can be this know-it-all aspect or a willingness or an unwillingness to see things from a different point of view sometimes or something is totally based on logic and we don't see the larger picture there is ba- there is possibility of that but i think to be honest the west have more of a under a better understanding of the non-dual philosophy sometimes um, so yeah i mean because if you think about it in india a lot of the gurus actually don't teach Tattva Masi, they don't, that's not their philosophy that they teach. A lot of them just get people to be wrapped around rituals and um, traditions and doctrines and dogma and, and the same issues that the West face, people in India face. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think, again, um, I understand where Jason's coming from, but I think the, the issue has also grown into India now. It's been kind of seeped in um whether it's a good thing or a bad thing um in my opinion india isn't as spiritual as it once was i think there is this idealistic view that india is still spiritual maybe there's remnants of it but you will have when you go there you kind of find that even spirituality is very commercialized and very much just it is a business so it's so yeah it's kind of you know it's not just a western issue whereas in the east it's much more of a collectivist mentality where it's more of a holistic culture where we depend on the traditions over and above our own egocentric beliefs and our egocentric interests and needs. We are part of something much greater. And that's one of the big points in the East is that you have this kind of unity based on the traditions of that culture. Now, today we're speaking about Guru Purnima, which is mainly celebrated in India. So people have a connection to Sanatana Dharma, Hinduism. And that's being kept alive and it's the longest enduring culture on the planet even though it is constantly being attacked by external forces Never- well that's true i mean i only have to be on uh, tiktok or sometimes even youtube you can see the comments sometimes can be quite discouraging if you're if you're a hindu um or you're teaching aspects of hinduism or you or, you know, it's not, I feel that sometimes the algorithm doesn't favor uh, you if you're talking about uh, Hindu philosophy. But in general, Hindu philosophy has been, or Indian philosophy, has always been kind of misunderstood and uh, misinterpreted. Or people see it through a Western lens, as Jason was saying, instead of looking at it through the lens of the logical and rationality of that region the eastern logic and rationality is very different to the western logic and rationality Uh, but the one thing that is very good about the east well back in the day at least um, was that gurus would even debate each other teachers would debate It, it wasn't about who is going to win the debate but more or less it was about the idea winning and what idea would be the most victorious. So this was something that um, was so great about the East. So, uh, yeah, so in Guru Purnima, it's a very special day for us. I mean, without, um, you know, even for me, without my Guru, I don't think I would be able to 
be able to share the wisdom that I share on this YouTube channel or on this on my podcast is definitely all thanks to uh, my guru and his wisdom so I do believe that and not only that I don't just have one there's so many teachers and uh, spiritual teachers that have helped me in advancing my spirituality making me understand things a lot more and entering deeper into the deeper aspects of the teaching as well being ready for that requires I, I find a, a grace from the guru the the blessings from the guru so I think that is necessary um, but yeah let's continue on kept alive and it's the longest enduring culture on the planet even though it is constantly being attacked by external forces nevertheless this idea of guru in the west a lot of people have a negative reaction to it and a lot of people will make fun of particular gurus because look let's be frank there are some gurus out there not just living but also before our time who have used it for their own benefits for their own self-interest and for making money, for influence, etc. But when you go to India, actually, a lot of the gurus. By the way, I've I've not seen this video before. This is my first time seeing it and reacting to it. So I'm kind of glad that he kind of said the same thing I said in the very beginning. So that's interesting about you know that there's some gurus in the past and even in the present who just want to have money or um, they have other intentions like power and influence uh, to kind of be in that position so uh, they have other intentions rather than helping somebody achieve liberation or to be free from their ego identification i would say over 90 percent are actually genuine and you'll find gurus actually in smaller communities where the okay that was interesting you said 90 percent. i don't know if i agree uh, with that number, 90%, I think that's kind. I think there's a lot more fakes than there are genuine ones, but that's me. Um, but yeah. Influence, etc. But when you go to India, actually, a lot of the gurus, I would say over 90% are actually genuine. And you'll find gurus actually in smaller communities where the community is connected to the guru. Just because you see one guru on TV doesn't mean that's how all gurus are. Very important point, and I'm glad Jason mentioned this, and it's true. Just because there's a popular guru on TV doesn't mean that they're the ones that are representing all of the spiritual wisdom of the East. Now, in India, the one thing that is good, and somewhat is happening also with the advent of the internet and uh, internet communities, is that you can have smaller groups. Therefore, if there's smaller groups more likely that guru will be able to help you, that teacher will be able to help you. Uh, now, if a guru has millions of disciples, you go to wonder, how are they actually impacting those individuals? It's, very, it's impossible. It's not physically possible to be with a million people. So how can that guru actually guide you in your life? Everybody is different. Everyone has their own karma. Everyone has their own tendencies, their own vasanas. So... It's really unrealistic to expect a guru to look after a million people. So when you see these big shot gurus on TV or who are able to um, get the algorithm to favor them, it's that, you know, how much help can they really provide, you know? Um, and, you know, it's like when I did the reaction video to Sadhguru, the guy who the boy who asked the question said he was a fan and and it's a shame because should you be a fan of a guru or should you follow the guru and be a disciple and, and that's when i think the value of a guru is depleting even in india because when you say you're a fan you're kind of implying that the guru is just another celebrity and that takes all the spirituality and the vitality away from that beautiful role that can have a true impact on your life that may be a popular guru and that doesn't mean that that's how the tradition ordinarily is it's usually much more private and much more communal as opposed to worldly exposure i agree 
the the more genuine ones will probably be smaller and will probably not want to grow even if they do grow i think they would be making sure that they're only they make it clear that the message is for a handful of people although many may be able to hear the message but to truly listen and soak in the presence of the the teacher is only really a few so uh, and that's only that's physical physically possible right so it's not possible for the guru to be amongst hundreds and thousands of people every day. Um. ...and much more communal as opposed to worldly exposure. And so the sad thing is in the West, we are slowly seeing the death of the expert. Because of the rise of technology, a lot of people think that they know a lot more than they actually do. and. We, we're seeing all around the world the death of the expert, where a lot of people will not consider an expert's opinion, even though they have decades of experience in that particular field. And being That's very true. And we've seen this recently with the whole um, COVID situation, people not believing in the experts and going with whatever the culture gurus are saying, like Jordan Peterson, they or you know, Brett Weinstein and... Eric Weinstein, whatever, Russell Brand, these more cultural gurus have more of an impact than actual real scientists or real experts in the field. And it's crazy um, that, I, and the death of the expert really started when we start thinking that we, that, you know, for example, a businessman can do a better job than a politician. Um, as much as politicians are really bad at their jobs, um, a businessman would not understand the intricacies that go on in the in the aspect of governance. So, likewise, here I, I do agree with him. The death of the expert is what's causing a lot of problems. The fact that a few people also can uh, apparently do their own research, uh, apparently by checking out uh, one of the um, to seeing to seeing one of the um you know they just see one youtube video or they see one facebook post and suddenly they think they 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 know everything and that's not true um even with myself i mean before i share either i share what i consider to be reputed experts or i go to people who are experts and follow what they say um so i think that's more better thing to do uh hi vikramji um that was unexpected to see you reacting to what a surprise oh you know um he came up in my algorithm the other day or the week or the month and um why not so here we go um but yeah I, I agree with him on the basis of the death of the expert once we once we stop believing in experts we are going through a dangerous path in in everything. Um, so, because I will be doing a video on Jordan Peterson very soon because he's gone a bit off the rails and um, I think it's really important to talk about how these cultural gurus can start infecting r religious views and therefore it's not... It's not just about them affecting one particular religion. It actually has reverberations around the whole community, the whole spiritual community as well. So, for example, someone like Jordan Peterson is not just appealing for someone in the uh, who, who's a Christian or a Muslim or or someone from the Abrahamic tradition. He has influence even in the Indian community in the you know, the Hindu and Sikh community too. So people like, so I think it's really important that we talk about these things. So I'm really glad that uh, Jason mentioned that. That was quite a unique take to talk about the death of the expert. I wasn't expecting that, to be honest. Not consider an expert's opinion, even though they have decades of experience in that particular field. And being a guru is not... Now, imagine one thing before we continue on. It's the whole thing with um, Anthony Fauci and how, you know, someone like, uh, I forgot the guy's name, 
um, that was always kind of battling him in um, in in Congress, but it's or in the Judicial Committee, whatever they call it, and um, it, it's the same thing. Like someone who has had decades ex- of experience, we we're, we're willing to put a question mark on them, then actually have a look at that senator from Kentucky and see what his background is and what actually why is he so against particular experts so you know things like that um but yeah i, I agree we how we uh, why we do this beats me of experience in that particular field and being a guru is no different and it's kind of ironic that we see a lot of people who might just read one text and think they know a lot of things and think that they can speak down to the guru or think they know more than the guru themselves. Well, we see this with the pseudo non-dualists. They will question and will ridicule anyone uh, that will remotely talk about um, the texts or uh, or they talk about a video they saw or, or anything like that. Um, and to be honest, it's not. I think what Jason is saying is that it's not. He's not talking about questioning the guru in the sense of having a deep inquiry and, and trying to understand. I don't think he's talking about that. I think he's talking more on the level of, like people just start thinking they know everything, and therefore they have this subtle ego that just likes to question things that make no. Even the questions don't make sense. And the questions are kind of like worded in such a way where it's like a gotcha question. And that's not real inquiry. That is not really addressing true doubt. So um, I agree with him. Like there's a lot of people that even may read the Gita, but they pretend that they know what it means without studying different commentaries, without trying to even reflect upon it on the upon their lives or even practice it. Sometimes people are just so absorbed by the one singular view they have, they're looking at the whole picture. And that's what for me, um I think it's really important that we understand different perspectives and then look at our own practice. And then our own practice, our own experience should be the one that should guide us. Um, if it goes against what the your guru says you can address it with the guru and you know see where it goes from there but ultimately what you what you experience is your true guru and i encountered this on the channel myself i'm not a guru but i encounter it on the channel because i've studied under many teachers and all i'm doing is delivering the actual eastern knowledge but then other people will have a different opinion of it not based on the actual traditional knowledge but based on their own subjective opinion that's been warped in some sense by a western view of eastern spirituality maybe from western teachers so to speak but it's in he's right i mean we see this with the pseudo non-dualists right i mean we see this constantly happening where you know i look at some of the comments on my on the jim newman reaction video that i did and it's kind of shocking to see how people just simply do not understand what i'm trying to say because they they just keep regurgitating the same crap again and again the same nonsense again and again um so I, i'm with Jason on that uh, I do agree with him completely and it's a shame really because if he feels that it's happened on his channel I feel it happens sometimes when you know on TikTok or on on on, on this as well so um but yeah interesting stuff it's important to learn directly from the source to go to the actual source scriptures and sometimes to learn directly from a teacher and that's what the guru disciple relationship is all about it's about passing down that knowledge that goes back thousands and thousands thousands of years all the way back probably to even further than the indus valley civilization we don't really know but we have this lineage of knowledge that's passed down from generation to generation 
And so it's a living lineage. It really is a living lineage. And if you are blessed to have come across the Eastern spiritual teachings, then you are part of that living lineage that we are all in this together, moving towards individual liberation and collective peace step by step. And we've been doing this incrementally for thousands of years. And that's what this guru-disciple relationship is all about. And as I said earlier, there are different ideas of what the guru is, right? Because it's been trivialized in English. And so we have all of these different type of gurus, right? We've got sporting gurus, boxing gurus, etc. But in India, it's really important that because when we use the word guru, so for example, if we look at Indian classical music, traditional music of India, the beautiful traditional music of India, the teacher themselves is a guru. This is the difference between Western classical music because in India, going back thousands of years, I don't know so much about today, but in the traditional way a Indian musical master guru would learn, they would learn the Vedas and Upanishads in tandem with the music that they were mastering. So it was required to understand Vedanta as a musical guru because the actual tradition and all of the knowledge of the Upanishads is embedded within the music of India. And so that's why it's important. But in saying that, the ideal guru is the one who has direct knowledge of Brahman. Brahman here being the ultimate reality of existence. The substratum of everything we can conceive of. The ultimate consciousness, the supreme consciousness that you and I are, that connects us as one. And so the ideal guru is the one who has the direct knowledge of Brahman. Very true. I'm glad that he's mentioned this. That is the real guru, the one who has the direct understanding, who can take you to the direct realization of Brahman. So really good. Really like what Jason has been saying. Nothing I disagree with, actually. Pretty much we're on the same page on, on everything. And this is how the tradition began from the gurus who had a direct knowing of Brahman. And this goes back to the Rishis, the ones who actually delivered the Vedas, the ones who revealed the Vedas through themselves. And going through the tradition, then we have the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, the Mahabharata, which includes the Bhagavad Gita. And you also have the Ramayana as well. So you have all of these great texts that have come down from the Vedas based on the Vedas, on the great knowledge of the Rishis. And this is what the Guru is passing down, the one who has the direct knowledge of Brahman. Now, there's not many people who have that direct knowledge of Brahman, obviously, throughout time. That's why we can probably count all of the great enlightened masters on two hands. But... It's true. Not everyone will talk about Brahman and talk about how to understand Brahman and have the direct realization of Brahman. It's very rare. Very few even want to seek this. So um, if you have a guru that can tell you about this, you're very lucky. The point is, is that we all benefit from this knowledge. And when we look at this guru-disciple lineage, it's very important as we realize in Upanishads to stay close to a guru, to learn directly from them. And there's a few reasons for this, because obviously you're sitting close to a master who is enlightened, but also a guru has an exemplary character. They don't mm -hmm. have to act moral. Their exemplary character is naturally moralistic. They care for all. They have infinite compassion and forgiveness. I've, I've, I've often talked about this, how a guru is very genuine and um, very simple. They they don't have to have, they don't need to be taught a moral code. They are naturally moral, you know, have morals. That's for others. And so when you sit beside a master for a long period of time, then it has a effect on yourself and then you bring that out into the world. Now when we look at the traditional guru-disciple relationship, it obviously began in very small settings. Like in Sanskrit we have the word gurukula. Now gurukula 
means living near the master in their dwelling and being educated in Sanatana Dharma, but specifically educated in Vedanta. When we talk about Vedanta, we're talking about the Prashjana Trahi. Now, the Prashjana Trahi consists of three texts, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, and the Bhagavad Gita. Now, obviously, as you know from my previous videos, as you go further in your training, you will learn the Nididhyasana texts, Ashtavraka Gita, uh, Avaduta Gita, the Mandukya Upanishad Karika, these sorts of texts. And so that's what a guru kula is. You stay near the master and you learn directly from them. And that benefits all. And in the traditional setting, you actually had to remain with the guru for 12 years, if you can believe this. Not in all schools, but generally there was this idea of a 12-year period where you would go through training with a guru. And that's when you would be tested at the end of the 12 years to see if you were actually ready to actually deliver the knowledge yourself and to continue that living lineage. Not all would finish that, obviously, but there would be a very small minority that would finish that and, and then take the knowledge out and deliver it to others. And the reason why this happens is because the guru is not no ordinary person. They're no ordinary person. They've gone through their own training. And to become a guru, as I said, when you do have an exemplary character, you actually have to go through a process of purifying the mind. A lot of people get this wrong, particularly Westerners who study Eastern spirituality, where they think that, oh, I just know this knowledge. Now I'm enlightened. And it's like, well, yes and no. It's as Ken Wilber said, you can still be a spiritual a-hole after enlightenment, so to speak. And now I'm not saying that any of these Westerners who claim this are enlightened, but they miss the point where you have to go through a sense of purification to understand the deeper aspects of Vedanta. Yeah, as Kevin Wilber talks about spiritual integration, and that's basically the integration of... Um, the spiritual teaching with the mind and getting rid of all the conditioning of the mind. So what we tend to find is that a lot of spiritual teachers, um, they start showing tendencies of wrongful behavior only because the spiritual realization has not penetrated deeply enough into the mind or it's still continuously working within the mind. That's why it's not really good to declare one to be enlightened because one, if you mess up, you ruin the whole image of enlightenment. So um, it's really important that nobody declares it so quickly. And these Western uh, people, like especially the pseudo non-dualist, who just quickly go and start spreading the fact that they know it all, and you know that there's only this, and uh, there's nothing else. Is apparently whatever that kind of thinking. Uh, that type of mentality that they have is more detrimental than actually beneficial because sooner or later, how long will their message stand for? I'm not sure. Especially. And that's why the guru is a kind of healer in some sense because they clean our eyes of the illusion of Maya, of measuring the reality into this and that which is what Maya is. It's the measurement of reality according to our own conditioning, according to the socialization process that we've gone through. And then what the guru does is they apply the non-dual medicine of Brahman into our mind. And this is encapsulated with a beautiful verse within the Guru Stotram, which states, Salutations to that glorious guru, who, when I was blinded by ignorance, applied medicine and opened my eyes. So in the Guru Stotram, it's even saying that the Guru applies medicine and opens their eyes. Now, this mm -hmm. medicine is obviously the knowledge of Brahman. That's the medicine we're talking about. Medicine here is referring to the wisdom of the ultimate. That is the ultimate medicine anyone can have. No medicine in the world can compare to that knowledge. And that's the importance of being with the Guru. So in conclusion, guru is not an old idea and we shouldn't have a negative reaction to it because part of the spiritual path is humility and deference. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier with the death of the expert, a lot of people have a problem deferring to someone who has more knowledge or is more skillful at something. And this is becoming a big problem in the world, not just in the West, because we're becoming so individualistic and we don't want to think that other people have more knowledge than us. And what I've seen also in the West is a lot of people have a problem deferring to even their elders these days. And so a guru's got no chance if that's the case. I remember growing up when there was a big emphasis on respecting your elders, even if they were in the wrong sometimes. It's part of paying respects to those who have come before us. Sure, there is a limit to that, but we often don't get to that limit. Hmm. Usually in ordinary life, we can just pay respects to our elders or to anyone in general, and we can defer if we have the humility to do so. And this is a problem with people disrespecting the guru-disciple relationship and a guru themselves because people have a problem with deference. And part and parcel of the Eastern spiritual traditions is humility and deference. You need to have the humility to defer to the one who has the knowledge. And if you are not willing to do that, then you will never have the knowledge because mm. that humility is a priority in understanding the deeper knowledge. You need to lower yourself to have deference to a guru to understand that deep knowledge. That's why we bow. That's why we prostrate before all of the great masters. It destroys our ego because we're giving ourselves over to that individual who has the knowledge. And we are saying, look, we don't have the knowledge, but we desperately need it because from birth we have suffered. Sure, we've had momentary moments of joy, but they never last. The suffering comes back. And it's based on our own conditioning, our own socialization process, which builds this illusion of this identity. And the guru is there for us. If we have the humility and the deference to pay ultimate respect to them and to learn from them sincerely. So in conclusion, I'd just like to pay pranams to all of the great gurus living and who have attained Mahasamadhi before us. And let's hope that we can all have the humility and deference to continue this lineage far, far into the future. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Wow. So that was actually really good. Um, I really like Jason. Jason's a really nice guy. Um, I think everything he said is really on point, um, especially when it comes to understanding the importance of a guru having humility and the disciple having humility, the importance of the disciple being able to defer the um, one's identification to the guru so that for we can understand a deeper reality and therefore clean our mind of our ego purify our mind and therefore be ready for the spiritual realization and wisdom that is required so i do agree with jason that was a very beautiful video a very wonderful video and it's not all the time i get to watch a video where i really enjoy what i listen to or i learn from someone or, or get a different perspective what i really liked about jason was he and this is a difference between uh, the pseudo non-dualists and and people like jason jason has understood the foundation of the eastern wisdom and therefore speaks from that level and you see a clear difference um, in the way the message is delivered i'm sure I'm not saying that I would agree with everything Jason says. That's impossible. But I, I could see myself having a real cool conversation with him than, say, uh, a cult Theo or um, what's the other girl's name, Ariana or even Tony Parsons. Um, which, mind you, I think I, either tomorrow there, there will be a video on tony parsons coming soon um so i saw some messages um i know vikram asked a question so i'll answer them now but 
um, before I do that, you know, as Jason said, you know, pranams to all the gurus that have taught us this high truth, this high wisdom, this wisdom that has taken us from darkness to uh, illumination, the wisdom that has taken us from ignorance to wisdom uh, you know without that we wouldn't be where we are today um so you know i truly feel that without respecting our gurus we cannot be where we are um whoever your guru is you know truly just give them the respect they deserve and um you know it's not that yet to when we say i'm sure when jason mentions deference and deferring everything to the guru it doesn't mean that you have to practice everything the guru says to the t but you should at least practice that direct understanding and direct realization of brahman that is something that you should definitely practice so yeah um right let's have a look um so vikram you say i've done an hour-long meditation twice till now to now months ago and on my first meditation when I was 40 minutes in I got to a point of complete emptiness and falling in nothingness for some seconds and then I came out and that's all my uh, then and then I came out that's all my inside I wonder what are the things happened to a person like you who's meditating for 10 years please share your beautiful experience or some experience or insight in the end of the video um okay so i know what you're on about like for example you're meditating and what happens is you get to this shunyata you get to this uh, formlessness and then suddenly you feel like what's next what is going to happen next will i stay alive will i die will i remain um or you may not even feel that it, it may just be that you just see emptiness and that's it. Um, for me, uh, what happens when it comes to meditation is I tend to forget about it the moment I stop meditating. Um, if I cling on to an experience, it will inevitably affect my meditation the next day. So it's always important that whatever insight you get in your meditation practice, appreciate it, be grateful for it, offer your gratitude to existence for that wonderful uh, knowledge and experience, but move on. Don't get stuck on the... Don't get stuck on the experience so much. Um. And just because, and, and you know, I've had experiences which have been um, where there's a great expansion, where there's bliss, where there's joy, where there's uh, love, this overwhelming sense of love and compassion, where you feel like there's waves of love everywhere. I have felt that, but the thing is, there is always something aware of that experience. That awareness is everything that awareness is what matters and that awareness is simply the witness to all things even the experience of meditation is occurring to the it's occurring to awareness itself so um for me what i want you to understand is that enjoy your meditation don't be serious about it enjoy it um, be free with it flow with it see where it takes you and um and yeah the, the moment the, the more you do meditation with love and with a smile with with an aspect of feeling like it's good fun that will help you for sure um so i i think that's um that's the thing for me what that's what i've learned the most in meditation is just forgetting what you experience and going and actually bringing that state of mind to your day-to-day -day life for example if you're meditating for 30 minutes or an hour or an hour and 30 minutes or two hours every day and yet you're you're 
you're nasty at home or you're horrible to your spouse or to your partner or to your children or to your colleagues what's the point of being spiritual then what's the point of meditating so the importance is that the meditation really begins when you go into the world and you don't get kind of dragged into the drama of the world you don't allow your allow your peace of mind to be disturbed by what's going on around you or things that are happening in your life so it's about bringing the meditation into your day-to-day life and just being in that aware state in that witnessing state as much as possible doing that is much better than anything else in my opinion it's very important that we continuously bring that experience of meditation into our day-to-day life that's the real meditation the two hours that we're doing the meditation for or the half an hour or the one hour or 10 minutes that is the training that's the preparation the real thing happens afterwards so remember this that meditation I may have the best experience but it means nothing if I'm an absolute idiot to people around me and to to my surroundings so it's really important that one is like Jason said you have to be honest you need to have humility and to have humility means that you accept that these experiences are not happening to you yeah, it's not happening to Rahul for Rahul to have an ego about. No, or to have pride about. No, this is the meditation is simply showing that I am not Rahul. Therefore, what is there to be proud of? What is there to be, uh, what is there to find amazing in that? You know, um, but what, what answer of giving you, Vikramji, is one where I think you're prepared for. I wouldn't give this answer to everybody and I would give different answers depending on the person. But I feel with you, with the comments I've seen from you previously is why I've mentioned this to you. And also with your experience that you've just had in meditation, I think you you understand that meditation is more uh, of you understanding what the observer is than anything else. Uh, hey, how are you, uh, Tom Pushenrab? Uh, I agree completely. Respect towards the guru is best to have uh, proper transmission. Yes, we, if we really want to have that transmission, if we really want to have that wisdom, that direct knowledge, that direct perception, we do need to ensure that we respect the guru completely. Um, you know, I I I don't really share much about my guru, and but. The one thing I I will say is I gave my, I I asked my guru to look after my material life so I could concentrate on my spiritual life. And there's a reason for that. I could have asked my guru the opposite, that you take care of my spiritual life and I will look after my material life. But you know what would have happened? If I was looking after my material life, I would have got consumed by my, my material life and I would have not bothered about my spiritual life the beauty of concentrating on the spiritual life is that you have to do minimal effort with your material life and you find that existence looks after you and it's about it's what jason mentioned when he said deference when you defer things to the guru you it makes your life much easier and and i do believe that you can make your life absolutely easy by just surrendering to the guru when i say surrender i don't mean like you surrender everything that even your intellect no a guru will never ask for your intellect the guru is the one that sharpens your intellect and tells you to utilize it even if it's at the detriment of the guru themselves because at the end of the day your intellect your discernment is what's going to ensure that you stay on the path of righteousness that you're, you're on the path of dharma, you're practicing your svadharma, your own personal uh, righteous path, and you're also understanding what is real and unreal. That's the whole purpose of life. So 
just never forget that. So, you know, there's so much we can grasp and get from our gurus. And the thing is, whoever you can learn from, you know, um, learn from them. Be grateful for them. Because you never know if that person wasn't in your life where you would be today. I often think about this. That if I didn't get in touch with my guru, if I didn't get the company of my guru, where would I be today? Would I have this real interest in spirituality? Would I have this desire to know more? You know, I could just be content with keeping up with appearances when it comes to spirituality. But that wasn't enough for me. And that's all thanks to my guru. Everything I, I give thanks to my guru for. So, you know, it's really important that we understand the importance of having a true teacher who can guide us on the right path, who can guide us towards the truth of who we are, of our real nature. And not only just guide us there, but help us acclimatize to it, help us immerse in it. So that is really important. Um, you're very welcome, Vikramji. Um, thank you for the beautiful question and insight into and sharing your experience of meditation, because it's not easy to share what we feel in, in spirituality or what we experience. So I appreciate that uh, a lot, too. Right, I am going to go. Um, I have a few things to do for the podcast, and um, a few, a lot of things to edit. Recently, I've, you know, I've got to, I've got to get my game up on editing. If you do listen to my uh, podcast on Apple, um, oh yes, uh, one last question: Your favorite fav five books? My guru is YouTube as of now, as Swami Sarvabhi Anandaji. Well, you're in the right hands, um, especially with the latter. Um, but I can give you my favorite five books for sure before I go. That's absolutely fine. Um, so first one is um, I love the Upanishads, the Tao Te Ching. Um, I would say the next one would be Being Aware of Being Aware by Rupert Spira. Um, I, I might give more than five. The Upanishads, Ashtavakra Gita, um, I really like the Guru Granth Sahib. Um, and the teachings in there, especially from Sukhmani Sahib and Japji Sahib. I really love that. Um, yes, there's maybe a few more. Uh, the Guru Gita actually is a really cool text, um, which I've really enjoyed. Um, yeah, so those are the ones that I can think of. Oh, and basically the collective works of Ramana Maharishi um, or anything by Ramana Maharishi um, is phenomenal. So yeah, there's there's so much I'm reading right now as well. So uh, my favorite five books will keep on changing, but I don't, it's really hard. There's so many books that I think are relevant and therefore I wouldn't say like they're my personal five favorite books, but they're the ones that have helped me the most. And I think that's why they're my favorites because they always get me on the straight and narrow path. And yeah, so um, but yeah, that's my answer. Um, next week, it'll probably be a totally different one. So <laughs> who knows? But yeah, um, as I was saying, um, and thank you, Vikramji, for that question. Um, before I do go, uh, on Apple now, if you listen to my podcast on Apple, 
before to get the extra content you had to sign up to patreon and now i've allowed uh, i've been approved to um put a subscription on my podcast so you still get the free podcast but to get ad free versions and to get the guided meditations and get the um full conversations with the bearded mystic that can you can get that by subscribing you can either pay well it's different cost according to the currency but uh, that you're in but uh, say for example in the US it would be 9.99 per month or you can pay 99.99 so around 100 dollars um per year so you're kind of saving 20 dollars um by signing up for the annual so um it's another way which you can support the podcast and help with the running cost of doing videos like this um and doing the podcast and the conversations and the meditation classes so every any way you can support the podcast i truly appreciate it uh but yeah other than that even just watching it and being with me is is a blessing too um thank you very much to each and every one of you who who has watched this um take care i wish you all a happy guru purnima and thank you for being my teachers as well uh, i know that it seems like i am the person that seems to be teaching or whatever but trust me i learn much more from you than you can ever understand um so you know thank you to each and every one of you take care i shall see you tomorrow so tomorrow i'll either look at tony parsons or jordan peterson i'm not too sure yet but um yeah we'll look forward to that okay take care everyone bye